Well, over the last few days, the opening games took place in the Bob Willis Trophy, a county competition named after the former England captain who died in December at the age of 70. Bob's funeral was a private affair, but there were plans for a memorial service at Southwark Cathedral, originally scheduled to take place this week. Sadly, that's being postponed because of the COVID crisis, but this week does see the publication of a new biography, Bob Willis, a cricketer and a gentleman, all proceeds from which will go to Prostate Cancer UK. The book was the idea of Bob's widow, Lauren, who we'll speak to shortly, and has been edited by Bob's brother, David Willis, who we'll also speak to in a few minutes. But first, Eleanor Oldroyd is speaking to Mike Brearley, the man who captained Bob in his most famous test performance at Headingley, 1981. Here's Willis in, bowls to Bright. Bright bowled! The middle stamps out of the ground. England have won. They've won by 18 runs. Willis runs around, punching the air. The boys invade the ground, and the players run helter-skelter for the pavilion. Well, what a finish. Bright bowled Willis for 19. Willis has taken eight wickets, his best in his test career, in his entire career, too. A phenomenal performance by Bob Willis and Australia all out for 111. England have won by 18 runs. He was a fine man and a very, very fine bowler. Uh, one of the best England fast bowlers I think has ever been. And um, everyone who knew him will miss him hugely. What are your memories of that extraordinary final innings at Headingley and Bob bowling from the Kirkstall lane end? I've heard him say that you basically just gave him the ball and said, Bob, just keep on bowling like you, like as fast as you can. Well, Bob was in, he wasn't in great form before that match and at the beginning of that match. I think he took one wicket in the first innings when they scored 400. And... Um, on the night before the last day, and he'd been bowling no balls and he hadn't bowled so he didn't know whether to bowl as fast as he could as he used to do or cut down a bit. And on that last evening before the last day's play, a few of us were having a drink with him and we said, he said, well, what shall I do tomorrow? And he said, look, if you bowl as fast and straight as you can, the way you can bowl, forget about those no balls and things like that. Uh, they won't be able to play you. And um, he started off bowling uphill, which is the end he wanted because he was nervous about the no balls, and he thought if he bowled downhill, he'd overstep. And after he bowled very well in, in the second innings, and after a while, I think he said, let me have a go at the other end. And I wasn't quite sure, and then I thought, yes, why not? And then he started to bowl down the hill in exactly the way I've just described, and he said to you, and uh, and it was incredible. Obviously, it was a, there was a lot of luck that it turned out the way it did, but it was fantastic bowling, supported by other people, Chris Old in particular in that innings. But he took eight for 43 and uh, finished the game off with a, a middle stump Yorker that took the middle stump out of the ground. It's extraordinary to watch that back now. And, and you talk about, about... We talk now about a sportsman being in the zone at particular times. Yes. Was he in the zone yes. that day? Bob was in the zone in general more than anyone else I played with, or possibly against. I didn't know them so well, the ones I played against. He, at the end of an over, he'd stride back off down to long leg, you know, to his sort of resting place in the field. And someone like Bob Taylor, the wicketkeeper, or Alan Knott, or I would run alongside him two steps to his one, encouraging him, making the odd suggestion, seeing how he felt. And it was like, you know, you almost had to knock to find out if anyone was in. He was in, <laughs> but he had this particular zone he got into. And I think it helped him a lot. I think it was a sort of... It may have had something to do with the Bob Dylan. You know, he changed his name to added the name Dylan because he was such an admirer of Bob Dylan. So it was something of that sort of ecstasy or total focus uh, that might be in some great performers on the stage and great artists, perhaps, um, which I think he had. And, you know, he got into that zone and he was in the zone on that day. But you could still get through to him. And right near the end when Dennis Lilly scored a quick 20 or something, um, which was a lot of runs in that context, um, Mike Getting said to me, tell him just to bowl straight. Don't let him get either side of the ball to help it on the leg side or cut it on the off side. And that's what he did. Mm. And he came back and bowled dead straight again. 
what was he like to captain and all the, the players that you captained in your successful career? What would you say defined Bob apart from that, that extraordinary focus yes. and concentration? Well, he was a terrific team man. He was an enthusiast. Uh, sometimes he could be a bit down, but other times he was very amusing, very funny. And he was quite fierce. I mean, he was like a second row forward in a rugby team who sort of slogged their way up to the opponent's 25 and some fancy play by the backs make them trudge back to the back all the way back down the field and he he was he used to get very fierce if batsmen threw their wickets away especially young batsmen and we saw that of course <laughs> in his commentary work later as well and and he had yes. this image of being a little bit grumpy but but you obviously yeah. saw the good side the fun side of bob as well absolutely but i mean even the grumpy side had its <laughs> had its funny side to it as well, you know, when you knew him. He, he was fierce, but he wasn't, um, he wasn't unpleasant. He was just fierce. I suppose some people would be a bit nervous about him, especially if they were younger or didn't know him that well. But he was, he was, uh, and he was, he was a great player of charades, for example, in India, where we stayed in little hotels or uh, guest houses or things in the, up in the country. He, he would, uh, he would be a, a, a great figure of the, you know, the after-dinner entertainment, in-house entertainment. Where would you rank him, Mike, in, in the all-time great bowlers that you played with and played against? Well, I think he's up with them. Um, I suppose the people I think of in my career were Dennis Lilly and Jeff Thompson and the West Indian fast bowlers and then um, Richard Hadley and Imran Khan. And there was a great crop of fast bowlers as well as Mike Proctor of South Africa and and others, but I think Bob was up with them. He was as quick as them. He was tall. He was a very awkward bowler to face with his in slant, and occasionally the ball would straighten off the pitch. You know, moving from the leg to the off. And then he was unplayable. But he got this very awkward bounce. He was at you all the time. He was an attacking bowler. Uh, he he was very persistent. He made himself fitter and fitter. I think after the centenary test in 1977, he went to a man called Arthur Jackson, a Sydney doctor and a hypnotherapist, and he, uh, that was part of the hyp hypnotizing himself, not only for bowling, but for getting fit for training. And he did a lot more running, and he became able to bowl fast for a greater number of overs in the day or in the match. So he, he gained in stamina as he got more mature as a bowler. But he was, a, he, was a, he was up with them, and he and Ian Botham were any, uh, up with any of the pairs of bowlers at that time, really. If you think about that Headley Test match in 1981, we look back at that and we were remembering it all again in the summer just gone, this Ashes summer just gone. Yes. We talked yes. about Botham's Ashes, you talk about Botham's Headingley in 1981. Was it as much Willis's <clears throat> Headingley, would you say? Yes, I think it was. I mean... <laughs> Botham was extraordinary in that match, but then so was Bob Willis and, uh, in that last innings. I suppose Ian did, he, he also took uh, six or seven wickets in the match, as well as scoring 149 not out and 50. So, I mean, he did it in three of the four innings. Bob did it in one innings, but in the, cr in the crucial one. And it was a match winning, it was match winning stuff. If you could remember one thing about Bob Willis, what would that be? I think, I don't know, the sort of little remarks he made, like, they have to be spoken to. That was about um, sort of Gower and Randall, De David Gower and Derek Randall, you know, when they'd, they'd scored a pretty 43 and then got out. You know? um, uh, and that sort of fierce, fierceness, which he meant, but as I say, which wasn't, wasn't unpleasant. It was no malice in it. It was just that he wanted the best and wanted us to produce our best. Um, so that was one thing, and I think I think the other thing that I remember with great affection is his run up to bowl. You know, it was an extraordinary run up to bowl. Most people come in in a curve from sort of slightly wide of the stumps. He came in from behind the umpire and almost ran out towards the offside from behind the umpire to deliver the ball with his characteristic in swing action. Um, which actually, that was a big turning point for him early in his career when he moved from Surrey to Warwickshire. It was partly because at Surrey he thought he felt people wanted to turn him into a classical 
outswing bowler like Fred Truman or someone. And, you know, he, he actually said that he couldn't bowl and not hit the side netting in the nets. I mean, it was as bad as that for him. And uh, he only got back to being a good bowler when, he, again, when he went back to his old irrepressible, completely idiosyncratic action. Mm -hmm. So I think of him as this, and, and we called him Goose, you know, because of the, it, it looked as if he was, you know, laboring to take off as he ran into bowl, like a goose on the river. And, and, and there was something of that in, in the way that it was slightly kind of, slightly manic, slightly uh, over the top. And there was something of that in his humor as well. Mm. And just to go back to something you said about his almost uncompromising approach to, to players who he didn't feel were doing as best as they could. Do you think that maybe that made him not such a great captain? Because obviously he did captain oh, his country and he and, yes. and David Gower took over from him. I thought he was a terrific number two. You know, he was completely loyal and he would say things that needed to be said, but which, so, you know, might be confrontational occasionally or might not be welcome to everyone's ears. So I think he was probably, and it's not easy to be a fast bowler and a captain, I don't think, because of all the adrenaline that goes into the bowling and the zone indeed. And sometimes he could look at mid-off rather wooden and as if he wasn't completely engaged with it. I think he probably was, but I don't think he was as good a captain as he was a number two. That's Mike Brearley speaking to uh, Eleanor Oldroyd. And before we move on, just a quick mention that uh, at lunch here, uh, Pakistan are 53 for two, having chosen to bat first. As I mentioned, uh, this week would have been the memorial service for Bob at Southwark Cathedral, but sadly that's now had to be postponed. But this week does see the publication of a new biography. It's called Bob Willis, a cricketer and a gentleman, and all proceeds will go to Prostate Cancer UK. Well, the book was the idea of Bob's wife, Lauren. It's been edited by Bob's brother, David Willis, and both of them uh, join us now. I can see you, unfortunately, we're, <laughs> we're zooming from long range, but it's lovely to see you both, Lauren uh, Hi, and Jonathan. David. Hi. Thanks for being with us. Now, let's start with you, Lauren, shall we? How, how, how difficult has it been to produce a book about Bob so, so soon after he died? Well, um, Bob dying has been difficult, and also the lockdown has made it even harder, but actually the, doing the book has made it is, has been really lovely because, um, you know, I've had something to focus on and um, he had so many amazing tributes. Um, he was so loved and uh, so it's been a real honour to put it together. Yeah. And David, it's been, it's been, been tough for you too, presumably. Uh, yes, it's not, it's not fun uh, losing a brother you're very, very fond of. Could I just quickly put Mr Brearley and <laughs> Miss Oldroyd right on a couple of... <laughs> I, th I was expecting <laughs> this. <laughs> one, one is that Bob statistically was the most successful England captain in the 1980s, um, and I think he wasn't quite as bad as he's sometimes referred to. And I was delighted that Michael talked about Bob Dylan, because Bob Dylan's management in New York have asked for two copies of the book, <laughs> and Bob Dylan actually wants one, and we're hoping that the next... The next Bob Dylan album will be about cricket. And if that's the case, we shall be doubly delighted. But, well, that's uh, a, that, that'll be a challenge. Let, let's, let's, <laughs> OK, so, 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 so the Dylan, did they ever meet? Have they met? Well, I'm not sure they ever met, but certainly in 1984 at St James's Park in Newcastle, uh, Bob and Beefy both of them were invited onto the side of the stage and we could see them standing about six feet from Dylan as he was waiting to come on stage. And this right. went on for eight or nine minutes. Uh, and I said to Bob after the show, I said, well, what on earth did you say to Bob Dylan? That must have been exciting. And he looked at me as if I was mad <laughs> and said, speak to him. You cannot be serious. Of course I didn't speak to him. No. <laughs> and I just thought, my goodness me, you wouldn't get many opportunities to speak to your hero, but... No. I, 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 I wouldn't accuse neither of those two, Ian or, or Bob, of being necessarily shy and retiring characters either. I thought one, one of them would have... One oh, of I think, them would have I think Bob would have been absolutely terrified to have met his would hero. You? Yeah. Indeed. In awe. Yeah. Just, totally, just out of respect. totally in awe. In fact, I've actually just written a... Um, a handwritten note to Bob Dylan today with the uh, book, which made me cry, just telling oh. Bob Dylan how much he meant to Bob. I actually think that Bob preferred Bob Dylan to cricket. 
<laughs> right what, at the what, top what, of his what list. Was it about, what, what was it about Bob Dylan? Because it was clearly, I mean, it was an infatuation. I mean, to actually totally go to the length idol- of... Totally idolised him. Why? What about, what about his work? What about his words or the music or, what, or the person? Um... Yeah, I'm oh, not yeah, sure he, about the person, but he, he was, he, the words, he knew every single word to every single song. And I've been playing his new album, Rough and Rowdy Ways, which, by the way, is absolutely fantastic. So I'm hoping <laughs> that Bob now knows all the words to that album as well. Do you remember, David, when he announced he was actually going to put Dylan into his name? Well, he brought, uh, he brought I think, Times They Are a Changing Home in 1963 and listened to it about 320 times, uh, (laughs) non-stop, and said, this guy is speaking to me like nobody has ever spoken to me. And ever since 1963 until 2019, uh, he seemed to regard Dylan uh, as a messiah of some kind and worshipped him. He had all the albums, he listened to them all the time, and he found a guidance there, some sort of guidance through his life. Mm in the work of Bob Dylan. Uh, whether it helped with his cricket, I really couldn't begin to say. But, uh, no. In terms of the book, uh, the book, Jonathan, uh, really what it is, it's uh, half of the book is a biography. I mean, the story's quite well known, but it takes him through from birth to uh, his cricket career, about half of the book, and then the second half of the book is writing about his post, um, post uh, cricket career. So he's... Uh, uh, briefly a businessman with the National Sporting Club, and then he goes on into Sky and uh, cricket commentary and made a name for himself, eventually found his niche snarling and snapping at people uh, <laughs> with his chainsaw, uh, and uh, obviously that seemed to fit him very well, and he entertained a lot of people, as you know, in that role. So it's, it, 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 entertained, it entertained people, but do you think it gave a lot of people a false impression of, of what Bob actually, actually was? Completely, absolutely. Um, he, he adopted, he climbed into this uh, suit of clothes of the grumpy old geezer uh, yes. and, and played, the, played the role very, very well. But he was always right on the mark. He did have to write a few letters of apology <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> when you... When you've called an England opening batsman, how long must we put up with this, this agonised stick insect? Uh, <laughs> that's a little strong. And uh, I think uh, while we all thought that actually that particular opening batsman did look a bit like a frozen stick. <laughs> there, um, I'm trying to think who it was now, but don't mind don't, don't, don't well, it. <laughs> no, now. don't. I don't. We're not writing any more letters of apology. No, <laughs> no, 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 indeed. But... Um, no, we think we think it's going to be a very entertaining book. So there's yeah. Bob in his own words. So there's a chainsaw Bob chapter. Some of the best pickings out of that. Um, some of his own writing about something about Dylan. A lot about cricket. And of course, there's a lot of tribute. Some extraordinary people have have, have written seven or eight hundred words because they loved Bob and liked uh, liked his company. It was no hardship getting pieces from John Major, Beefy Botham, Elton John. Uh, Michael yeah. Holding, lots of people wrote some lovely stuff. Yeah. Did, did you um, f- find it frustrating, Lauren, that perhaps he was a bit misunderstood by people because of that snarly character on the telly? And, and he, he could be, as, as I remember, you know, Bob's obviously older than me, but so I was coming up into the game and who was this towering man who often had a sort of deadpan face and a lot of hair. And there was a lot, quite times I would like to have gone up to Bob and asked him a question, as a, well, rather like he, him and Bob Dylan, I suppose. And I never quite, I never quite had the guts to do it. And yet, and, you know, getting to know Bob on this side of the fence, of course, of course, I should have gone up and asked him. He'd have been too, too pleased to have helped. Yeah, I think that. I mean, I think he did give a, the impression of being a bit terrifying, but that's really because he was very shy. And um, and once you spoke to him, um, he he was so lovely to everybody. Remembered everybody's name, introduced himself as I'm Bob, and I remember people going, "Well, I know that." And um, he was just very very humble and um, and normal, and loved getting public transport, and lived a, a very very normal life. The um, the persona on the TV was, I mean, I I think I sort of wound him up a bit at, at home during the day, and then obviously Charles Colville was very good at doing that, and yes. um, and he thought about the lines, and some worked and some didn't, but he was he was very funny, and I used to um, actually love it. I think quite a lot of fans sort of quite liked it when England did badly because they knew that 
the <laughs> verdict or the debate was going to be much more fun in the evening. Fire up the chainsaw. Yeah. yeah. Was, was, he, was he rebellious, David? Again, that's a question. He sometimes might have given the impression of being a bit of a rebel. And then in looking at the book, there's a lovely photo of him uh, at the palace, having received his MBE. He's got all the gear on, his top hat and tails and everything else. And I suspect that, that could surprise some people. Because might have, again, the sort of Bob was being a slightly rebellious character, and yet there is very, very traditional, actually, in real life. Yes, I think he, he uh, often um, would take the establishment of cricket to task and disapproved of some of the ways in which cricket was probably run through his regime. But when crucial, uh, crucial moments came in his own career, for example, the Packer Revolution, uh, the South Africa breweries tours and so on, um, yeah. he actually stayed with the England cause. Uh, although he was very, very tempted financially to go both with Packer and to South Africa, when push came to shove, slightly to people's surprise, he opted to stay with the England camp uh, and, and, and stay with them. I'd like to pick up, if you'll indulge me, one little story about um, Bob being a Please. funny man. Yeah. Well, I went up uh, in 1977 to watch the Warwickshire-Australia match, the first morning of Warwickshire-Australia at Edgbaston. And would you believe Rowan Kanhai, that well-known West Indian superstar batsman for Warwickshire, was having a benefit champagne breakfast <laughs> to whom he invited the Australian team. And at quarter to 11, with the match due to start, Australia could not put 11 men on the field <laughs> because they had enjoyed the champagne breakfast so much. Several of them were still on their hands and knees in the bathroom. So Bob came to me and said, David, You've got a field for Australia. I said, what? <laughs> field for Australia? I can't, I can't field for Australia. I've got no kit. So he went and got me Alvin Kalacharan's cricket kit. What? I'm, I'm six foot three. <laughs> Alvin Kalacharan is five foot five. And I squeezed <laughs> myself ludicrously. I must have looked like a Tour de France cyclist or something. I have no idea. And off I went. I was pushed onto the field. And I did 40 minutes fielding at third man and mid on. Um, while the while the Aussies sobered up and came on, Jeff Thompson eventually came onto the field and said, "Right out, wealthy, you can go now." Um, <laughs> what, a, and, what a great sight that must have been! <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the, the PA, the public address announcer, spluttered into life as I went on the field and said, "And uh, and now fielding fielding substitute for Australia is is um, is who who is this?" Who is this? <laughs> And clicked off, you know. But Bob was determined yeah. that Australia should have 11 players on the field. He didn't want them to have any disadvantage, so he just dragged me out, pushed me out there, and obviously the whole Warwickshire team found this very amusing. That's a lovely story. Lauren, when you, when you see the heading 81 uh, and, and, and the amazing spell, obviously won the game, and he, there is this sort of like haunted face almost. I mean, he really was somewhere else, wasn't he? But... And it, was that a regular thing? And, and, or, or was it just on that particular day he just seemed to be transported off somewhere completely random, somewhere else where no-one else was, obviously? Oh, gosh, that's a difficult question. I mean, he, he was a very intense person, but most of the time he was just very funny. Um, obviously, I was um, a bit younger than him, so I was only 13 in 1981, but I do remember <laughs> watching it, and it was really sort of the thing that him and especially Ian Botham were the uh, reason that I... I loved cricket and um, and I love all sports, but um, yeah, I, I don't. Um, well, I'll ask David then. Yeah. Have you seen yeah, that so before, I think that David? Might be a better did, question did, for him. Did, did, did you did you see that in in other parts of his of his life where he kind of retreat into this this place where, where, where no one might really say so just a knock to make sure that someone was in? Well, he's he, he could be very intense. That's certainly true. And I think in that game, Jonathan, don't forget he was really battling for his career. Uh, he'd been, uh, wasn't selected for the match. Mike Hendrick was originally selected in front of him because they thought he wasn't fit. He rang the chairman of selectors, Alec Bedser, and said, no, I am fit. You should pick me. I'm going to be fine. So they intercepted the invitation to Mike Hendrick, pulled it out of the in tray, uh, picked Bob, allowed him to play. He didn't do all that much in the first innings, as Mike really said earlier. So when he turned to come down that hill, I think he knew... This was absolutely his last chance. This was it. He had to do something special 
something remarkable if he was ever going to pull on the England shirt again. And uh, that focused his mind very, very yeah. intensely. And when Bob focused his mind, it was very focused and everything went out the window and it clicked that day and obviously made him a, a bit of a national hero. It certainly did. did. Did he ever feel overshadowed by Ian? Well, he's always heading 81 Ian Botham, but I mean, Bob, Bob's part of it was clearly huge. One of the nicest things in the book, Jonathan, is, is Beefy Botham's tribute to Bob, which is very, very heartwarming. They were very, very close, very, very, very good mates. And when either of them had a really serious problem in their lives, whatever of whatever kind, whatever colour, they would seek each other out, probably drink a bottle or two of wine, <laughs> and, and would always, always go to each other with their biggest issues and biggest problems and um and beefy was very very fond of him and came down i mean all the way north yorkshire to wimbledon as he was dying and uh, made a couple of trips down and wanted to be very close which was which was very very nice to see he was um yeah he was fond of beefy and regarded him as a younger brother i think in lots and lots of ways and helped him when he was starting out and then just eventually tried to keep tabs on him and try to restrain some of his most uh, eccentric behaviour. One of the interesting parts of the book that I've uh, c come across was actually the, the defence of his captaincy the, uh, and the, uh, at Adelaide when he famously put uh, Australia into bat and it all went wrong and he got a lot of stick for that. I hadn't realised until I re read the book that actually he didn't want to do it <laughs> and that he was outnumbered by, uh, by, his, by, by the team basically and he was, uh, it was a real sense of frustration coming through that he would have to go out and defend his decision but actually he didn't want to make in the first place. Yes, I think, I think he was. He was extremely angry but he blamed himself because it was his responsibility to obey his own instincts and do what he thought was the right thing to do which was to bat but he allowed himself to be persuaded or bullied or well, he wouldn't be bullied but persuaded why the yeah. batsman didn't much much fancy facing the Aussie quicks. Could we have another day's rest, please, or whatever? And um, and put the Aussies into bat, and they made about 600 or something, and it was a disaster. And of course, of course, England uh, did it again uh, not that long ago, and with similar <laughs> results. I remember. Yeah. So there was a notion that I think he he was the, the feeling was he was captain by committee. There was that feeling, but I think if you're a a fast bowler coming in off a 45-yard run, you cannot yeah. be in touch with everybody and everything, and he needed input from other players. I think that's where the captaincy by committee thing Well, he, he also used to say that as he walked back for his 43 strides or whatever, Beefy would change the field when he wasn't looking. <laughs> so uh, that didn't help things either. <laughs> <laughs> he, he cared massively about cricket, Lauren, and I wonder how yeah. he'd feel about, about the, the, the Bob Willis trophy. Oh, Would he wow. be proud of that? Yeah, he'd be really, really proud. Um, I mean, I spent hours with him. He, he bought um, those sort of felt-tip uh, highlighter pens and did this amazing um, spreadsheet of how he, how he could try and transform the... Um, the cricket season in, in, in the English summer. Um, he was very keen that county cricket was played when nothing else was played and it was all divided into this is the time you play T20 and this is the time you play one day internationals, etc. And, and that um, England players could play county cricket. And um, so the fact that, I mean, it, it didn't um, get anywhere, of course, and he's been, he had done that for years and years. Um, but the fact that because of the current circumstances, there's now a curtailed county championship which seems to have aroused quite a lot of excitement and to be yes. named after him is a, is a real honour. Yeah, and I think he'd be very proud. And you, you've done some artwork for that, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, well, so during lockdown, um, when I was just sort of on my own for the first time in my life and struggling a bit, I, I ordered some um, paints and canvases and things and thought I'd have another go at... Um, art for the first time since my A-level 32 years ago and I didn't really know what to paint so I looked up some pictures of Bob and thought I'd do Bob's bowling action and um, <laughs> it's a sort of cubist <clears throat> homage to Bob and um, yeah may, people seem to like them and, um, and then we showed Edward Asprey the, the trophy designer my image and he thought it would be a better way of, of trying to make the trophy. So, I mean, that's a, a massive honour, an unexpected honour for me as well. 
what also is, is a, a kind of a tribute in a way is the way that everybody, even those, I remember uh, Alistair Cook copying Bob Willis's bowling yeah. action. So I've, seen, I've now seen two absurd efforts at Bob's bowling action take test wickets. One was Alan Lamb in Calcutta <laughs> in 1984. Victor was there when he ran from the boundary. No one else got a wicket, I don't think, in the entire game. He ran from the boundary with that, that right hand going, raking away like it did, like Bob did. And he got Prabhakar LBW. And then the next one was Alistair Cook, who would never have seen Bob bowl. But he did a Bob Willis impersonation to get a wicket at, at, at Trent Bridge a few years ago. And that's... I know, Bob was, Everyone Bob was did very Bob proud Willis. of that. But maybe, maybe they yeah. were all just laughing so much they couldn't concentrate on <laughs> defending their wicket. But, um, no, I mean, I think that his um, bowling action was very unique. I've been looking at a lot of photos of it. And, um, you know, I like the left arm above the head and um, all that sort of stuff. And um, You couldn't yeah, teach you someone that, to bowl like that, I don't no. think. No. No, and then when he was, when they did try to teach him, he he couldn't actually bowl straight, so it was better left to that strange um, style that he came up with himself. Yeah. Did he always have it, David? You you also played in the garden together. Was it, was it, did he come? Oh, you could yeah. have forty-three yards, I don't suppose. But no, but he could be quite fierce, even in in, in the garden with the the green the greenhouse with shattered window <laughs> panes. Of course, um, yeah. was the pavilion. I think I'd like to just, if I may, I know we're clocked ticking on us a bit. Three, yep. three, three groups of people should buy this book. Bob Dylan fans, because <laughs> every chapter is named after a Bob Dylan song, quite appropriately. So Bob Dylan fans must buy it. Cricket fans obviously must buy it. And the one thing we haven't spoken much about, but we're obviously very keen to mention, is the disease that killed Bob, prostate cancer, all the proceeds of the book are going to the charity. We think and hope the book will do very well. Yeah. Um, but anyone who's been touched by prostate cancer uh, needs to get involved, support the cause, read the book, and become a, a Bob Willis fan as well. Because I think all yeah. of those three groups of people, and there's lots of them, um, should go out and buy the book and, and, and make a donation. Yeah, I remember it's, 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 it's ironic we're doing it here. Three years ago, when my wife was going through this, uh, Bob took me to one side of the room at the back and sat down. We had about half an hour together talking about the whole business. Oh, really? wow. And so um, I'll never forget that. Um, How did he seem? He, How did he seem to you? Well, then, then he, he seemed he was he was having treatment and, and things were manageable. And but he was just speaking about his experience of going through that disease, and it was it was incredibly helpful. That's really nice. Of, I didn't, I, he didn't tell me that he'd ever said that to yeah. you, but that's typical of him as well. It's, but that, it's typical really of the nice man that, that, yeah. that people of my age got to know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, intimidating, a bit aloof and deadpan fr from afar. He didn't mean but, to be like what that. A close, <laughs> what a close and yeah. lovely man when he got to know. Mm -hmm. really Thank was. you too. David Lawrence, it, it, I'm, I'm sorry we can't give us other group hug. Oh, it'd be lovely. Uh, up, up here, but um, we, we'll, we'll see you soon. Uh, thanks for well. coming on. She is. Yeah. Thank you very much yes. indeed, Lauren. Brilliant. Okay. All the best to you. Thanks Not for having us on. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Bye. We've got Bye. the book here. Brilliant. Bye-bye.